My name is Misa. My full name is Misa Simeone. I am the owner and behavior consultant at Naturally Canine Behavior and Training. I am an IAABC certified dog behavior consultant. Um, I began my career in sheltering. So that was back in 2015. I was a shelter worker um, in Northeast Texas. And in that area of the world, we see a lot of herding dogs. So Aussies, cattle dogs, um, German shepherds. We had a very large population of them in the shelter. And that's kind of where my love um, of these dogs grew. So I've been a foster for breed specific rescue since 2014. Again, Aussies, Corgis, um, Border Collies, and mixes of all these breeds as well. Um, was an avid foster of them for quite some time. Still try to, but not as much anymore. Um, and again, if you know me, I'm just a herding breed and dog sport nerd. So that is a little about me and we can go ahead and pop over to the presentation and get started. Oh, and also here are my dogs. They're very cute. So of course I had to, I had to include them. So we can go ahead and jump into it. So the herding group, again, we're presenting from the US. I am going to be using AKC American Kennel Club metrics, but if you are in a different country, this might look slightly different for you because again, AKC recognized breeds are not universal. There are multiple kind of registries in the US. And of course, again, we have a ton of lovely mixed breed dogs that we are including in this, in, in this, presenta in this presentation as well. Sorry about that. Um, so per the AKC, there are currently 31 recognized breeds in the herding group. Um, again, there are several other herding breeds that are not recognized by the AKC, but they might be recognized by the UKC or other kennel registries abroad. Um, until 1983, they were not actually part of the herding group. They were part of the working group. Um, so just fun little interesting fact there. And there are, again, there are 31 recognized breeds. There's also many more than that that are unrecognized, but um, Given that we have kind of a time constraint, uh, we're not rushing, but there, there just is not time to talk about all the dogs as much as I would love to. So I am actually going to be focusing on the 12 most popular herding breeds per the AKC. Um, so we have an intro to the first six here. So the German Shepherd dog is the, I think, number th the third most popular breed of dog. Um, that is currently owned in the US. We have the Corgi here. So this is the Pembroke Corgi. Third, we have the Aussie. We have Shelties, also called um, Shell and Sheepdogs. We have the Mini American Shepherd. So you might hear them called Mini Aussies. They're here as well. We have the Border Collie. We have the Belgian Malinois. We have Collies, which come in a rough and a smooth variety. We have the Australian cattle dog, we have the cardigan corgi, we have the old English sheep, sheep dog, and then we have the Belgian chaviran, which is also called sometimes just the Belgian sheep dog. That's a whole other thing, we won't, we won't get into that. But um, again, so these are the 12 most popular breeds um, in the US in the herding group. So that's kind of where we're going to focus today. Um, and again, just to reiterate, all of this applies to mixed breed dogs. So if you have an Aussie mix, a Corgi mix, a Border Collie mix, any of the above, um, this presentation is going to be applicable to all of them. So a quick history on herding dogs. So the need for herding dogs really developed when agriculture um, began to take off. So livestock was being bred, livestock needed to be moved and there was just a new niche of working dog that popped up. Previously, dogs were used um, typically for hunting. And so this need for a dog that no longer wanted to kill small animals, but actually help, um, you know, take, take direction from humans and be used in that way came about. Um, early working dogs, included um, moving livestock. So that's something that you would see in the present day, as well as just keeping an eye on private property and grazing livestock, which depending where you are in the world, again, this, these are still modern uses of herding breeds. Um, and herding breeds 
were developed in two different parts of the world, um, or I would say the earliest herding breeds. So we have Central Europe, that's where you're going to see the pastoral breeds. So border collies, um, bearded, bearded collies, which we're not talking about too much, but um, the collie was kind of England, Ireland, Scotland, the UK is where you would typically see them um, come about. And we also have Eurasia. So that, those are going to be the spitz type breeds um, that we don't actually think about in the present day as being herding breeds. So the Samoyed um, is one example. And those were used to herd reindeer in the far north. So two different developments of herding dogs that were used for different reasons on different livestock, but the general need um, for a dog to help work them was there. So when we're talking about herding dogs, um, I think all of us probably have some idea of what that means. We think of livestock, we think of working dogs, but there are actually several different types of herding dogs. So each dog had a different job that they performed. Um, they typically even had livestock that they were specialized to. Um, and so I wanna dive into that a little bit more because each dog, depending on what their job was, is going to have slightly different breed typical behaviors. So gathering dogs, a border collie would be example of that. They are going to be typically working in front of livestock. They are going to be used to take that herd and bring them to their person versus a driving dogs so that could be an Australian cattle dog, an Australian shepherd. They're typically going to work behind and push them or drive them forward. Um, tending dogs, so we have German Shepherd, Belgian Malinois, Belgian Tavirin, um, they're going to be working at the side. So they're not working in the way that we would tend to think of herding dogs working. So we have this lovely photo here of those Australian cattle dog. They're right up next to that cow. Um, tending dogs are going to be working a little further away. They're going to be walking around on the side of the herd. And this is typically used um, when herds were being moved from longer distances, but there were people kind of there and they just needed somebody to keep them in. So that either sheep or cat cattle, whatever livestock that they were working, didn't stray out from their herd. So those tending dogs really just kept them in their line and walked beside them. So depending on the job, so we just kind of reviewed the different type of herding um, and herding style. So we have different behaviors that are associated with them. So there are a few different terms here that describe how a dog works. Um, and we're going to dive into it into the next slide, but we're going to break it down a little bit first. So um, a term that you'll hear referred to often if you really consume any information about herding dogs is going to be I. So what that means is you probably have seen the image of a border collie working and there's that classic image of the border collie stare. So they have what would be referred to as a strong to medium eye. Um, so they're going to be staring and moving livestock by using that pressure. So using that eye, using that really hard stare. Um, not all dogs work like this. So there are breeds that are considered strong to medium eye and then there are breeds that are considered medium to loose as in they just, that's not how they work. Um, next, we have posture, and that's just going to be what the dog looks like when it's working. So again, we kind of have that classic um, image of the Border Collie. They crouch very low, they have a very low posture, um, and they kind of have that creeping stalk. Um, again, not all dogs work like that. So we also have medium to upright breeds. That's going to be the Australian Cattle Dog, the Australian Shepherd, and You'll sometimes see them get down. Um, Aussies definitely can be a little bit stocky and creepy, but it's not typically to the same extreme that you would see in a border collie. Um, we also have breeds that are considered very upright and that they just don't tend to get low whatsoever. Um, that's gonna be the Belgian Malinois, the Belgian Jokirin, Corgis. They are what would be considered a very upright breed when they work, so their posture is just what we would probably consider it a normal stand is what they will look like when they're working. So we have distance. Some dogs work from quite a wide, long distance. Um, 
the border collie would be another example. Can you tell that I like them? I talk about them a lot, <laughs> but um, those would be one example of a dog that works from quite a wide distance traditionally. Um, all depending on the need of whoever is working the dog, um, there's always going to be exceptions. So even if a dog was specialized to work in a particular way, that doesn't mean that they were not trained to move and work in tighter spaces. But traditionally, you'll have some of those breeds work in quite wide spaces. They will do um, really long outruns, which means running towards them from a far distance. And then we have other dogs that are close running. So um, here's a very cute, cute photo of Corgis working. And you can see they're really, they're right up there. They're very close. So they work very close um, to whatever it is that they are on. So here we have sheep. Traditionally, they were used on cattle um, and their short little legs made sure it made it that, that they weren't going to be kicked. So that was another helpful thing with their structure. But again, they are very close moving breeds. They're much closer to um, the, the livestock that they're working with. Um, Australian cattle dogs also tend to be very close running breeds. Uh, from that last photo you saw, again, that, that dog is really up close, really getting in there. And um, we'll talk about why that is. Um, so the next is a bark bite. So <laughs> at the top of that, again, is the Australian cattle dog. If you have a cattle dog or also referred to as a healer, um, I'm sure that you have experienced a lot of barking and potentially nipping. So that is a behavior that is pretty integral to their work. They get up really close. They bark at, their, at the livestock. They will occasionally bite at the ankles. That's how they control movement. That is how they move livestock. Um, the Australian Shepherd, they tend to be vocal workers as well. Um, I would say that they are certainly less so than the cattle dog, but it's not uncommon for them to bark to help move livestock. It's also not uncommon for them to, again, bite at the ankles, um, bark, bite kind of in the general direction of the livestock to encourage movement. Um, and this is also something that we see in corgis and shelties. So this picture again is kind of perfect for that because we can see the dog barking in the direction of the herd. Um, corgis also are known for being bark bitey to whatever it is that they're moving. Sheltie is less so bite, but certainly bark. So anybody here who has a Sheltie, they, they have a, rep a reputation for being quite vocal and they are in their work as well. So traditionally they have been a vocal breed and their bark is used to control the movement of the livestock. So to move them in whatever direction it is that they've been instructed to move them. So we have some photo examples here just to kind of help better visualize the behaviors that we're talking about. So this it is a great example of a hard to medium eye as well as a low posture. So you can see here, um, the Border Collie is looking quite, um, quite intently at the livestock here. Um, it is already moving them because this is kind of an action shot, but again, it's really not hard to find a photo of them staring directly at whatever it is that they're working. And again, that's considered a hard to medium eye or a hard stare, depending on how you want to refer to it. Um, this is also a really good example, example of a low posture. So you can see that they are very down to the ground, they are creeping. That is very typical of how they move and work livestock. Here we have an Aussie. Um, not the best photo to demonstrate um, eye, which we talked about. They're kind of just moving in the general direction, but they are displaying here a fairly upright posture. So sometimes they'll get down low, but typically they're going to be working um, fairly upright. And then here we have a working Sheltie. They have a loose eye. They're not necessarily staring. They're just moving in the general direction of the livestock. They're also working with a person. Um, we can see that their posture is upright. They are moving, but they're not in that kind of stocky, crouchy um, position that the water collie is in. And we can also see that they are barking in the direction of the livestock. So really um, great photo that just exemplifies how they typically work when they are being worked. So to kind of get into herding behavior, it's really important that we understand what it is and where it came from. So all herding behavior is modified predatory behavior. Um, essentially what that means is we talked about earlier, 
dogs were typically first used in domestication as hunting dogs. They assisted people with hunting um, before we had more advanced technology dogs would actually complete a predatory sequence and bring, bring prey to humans, um, essentially. But for herding dogs, that's kind of the opposite of what we want. We want them to bring livestock, but we want them to be safe and intact and not harmed. Um, so through selective breeding, people, of course, bred that. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I am in any way a geneticist and I can tell you how that happened. Um, I am not. But yes, so clearly herding behavior was achieved through selective breeding. Um, and the objective, again, is to minimize the harmful predatory behavior while still maintaining desirable aspects of that sequence. So we would not have a we would not have a good working dog if some of those behaviors were not still intact. So, we would want them to orient towards them. We'd want them to stalk them. We want them to chase them. Those are all behaviors that are going to allow this dog to work and actually have interest. If the predatory sequence were totally, um, totally removed through selective breeding, we would have a dog that, again, they wouldn't be a threat to livestock, but they would have no interest in actually moving them and controlling their motion and bringing them to their person or to the desired area that they've been instructed to. Um, so this is a good way to segue into a predatory sequence and what, what that means um, for people who, this is the first time you're hearing of it. Essentially, it's a series of behaviors where one behavior triggers the next. In a good example would be either a wild canine or a free roaming canine who was hunting. The complete predatory sequence is down below as follows. So it'd be orient, which is going to be moving towards the prey. I stalk, so that's going to be again, they're actually now physically moving towards it. They're going to chase it. They're going to grab it and bite it. Um, and then of course, as, as follows, it is killed. It is dissected and consumed. So that would be the entirety of the predatory sequence. Um, in this next slide, we are going to talk about what an example of a monitory, uh, of a modified predatory sequence and what that looks like. So they're going to be slightly different depending on the breed of dog, because again, they each have slightly different behaviors in their behavioral repertoire, depending on what exactly it is that they were bred to do. So in the Border Collie, a good example of what that sequence would look like would be Orient. So they have seen it, they are moving in that direction. I, they are going to look at it. And in the case of the Border Collie, I could also be quite literal, but they are going to use that I use that pressure of um, staring and moving towards the livestock to help move them and control their motion. Stock, so they're going to move towards them and then chase. Um, it's not common to get vocalization or biting in the Border Collie. That's just not, not something that's very common in the way that they work. Um, below though, we have a slightly different predatory sequence. We have orient, eye stalk, chase, and then we have grab, bite. So in some cases, like in the Australian cattle dog, in the corgi, sometimes the Australian shepherd, just depending on how they work, um, is going to be again that grab, bite. So that could be biting at the ankles, biting at um, forearms, shins, that kind of thing, depending on where they've been instructed to move them or how tight the quarters they're in. Um, oops, we got some sound there. Um, but with that being said, so again, slightly different predatory sequence depending on the dog. And I also note here because um, of course there's going to be outliers, there's going to be exceptions to every rule. It's also important to talk about working dogs that are bred. Um, there's going to be differences between lines. So you've probably heard me say a few times with Aussies that sometimes you'll see this, sometimes you won't. Um, that will typically depend on what it is that they're being bred for um, in their work specifically. So if you have dogs that are being bred for a specific type of livestock, um, it typically changes how you'll want them to behave. So for example, Australian shepherds that are being bred for work and they are being bred for sheep, you're probably going to see slightly um, 
softer behaviors, more docile behaviors, just because sheep tend to be more docile. Again, there's an exception for the sheep as well that will be too much to get into. Um, but to counter that, dogs that are being bred for cattle, which Aussies also do work cattle, you tend to need um, just a tougher dog because as, as livestock, they, they tend to be tougher, they're larger, um, their behavior can be a bit more aggressive. So you'll need a dog that can kind of match that essentially. So differences based on what they're working, um, what they were traditionally bred to work, and again, between lines as well, because not everybody is using working dogs for the same reason that somebody else might be. So kind of to get into present day, herding breeds really have blown up. You probably see them everywhere. So German Shepherds, as I mentioned earlier, they're the third most popular pet breed, just period. We have Pembroke Welsh Corgis and Aussies, again, as really popular pet breed choices. And you've probably seen them everywhere. It feels like everybody um, can walk down a street and probably see a German Shepherd dog or an Australian Shepherd or, or a Corgi. They're very popular too. Um, walking um, in the park, you'll see a lot of people biking, hiking. Um, they tend to be you know, regarded as fairly popular choices as active companions. And desirable traits that are listed through the AKC and just other websites that you can do some brief information um, and research on are intelligence, loyalty, athleticism, that tends to be their appeal. They're regarded as being very smart dogs, which people think, awesome, that makes a really great pet. They'll learn easily. I can teach the behaviors easily. It's going to be great. We'll go jogging, we'll go biking, hiking, you name it. Um, so they're a really popular choice for that. Um, they're also, if you have ever watched um, sports like agility or dock diving, anything like that, either in person or on TV, herding breeds really dominate dog sports as well. So depending on the sport, if you've ever watched agility, you're going to see a lot of border collies. You're gonna see a lot of Aussies. You'll see cattle dogs as well, Shelties. They're all really popular breeds for dog sports, which is a fun kind of new way to channel a lot of those behaviors. So here's a great example of that. If you have the internet, um, you've probably seen this dog. Her videos running agility at Westminster with Jennifer Crank, they have been shared everywhere, like millions of times. They have millions of views. This is Pink the Border Collie. Um, so herding breeds get a lot of media time. Um, you'll also see them really popularly as animal actors. You see them in commercials. They are just kind of everywhere. They are also in a ton of movies, so popular media loves them because, again, they're thought of as highly intelligent, easy to train, um, just and a very loyal, active companion. So uh, here we have a Belgian Malinois. A lot of people don't love seeing their breeds used um, used in these kinds of movies because it attracts a large crowd, attracts a lot of interest to the breed. And as we'll talk about, they're not for everybody. Um, another thing that I want to talk about real quick is that herding breeds have really filled the niche for modern working dogs. Um, of course, they still do work the jobs that they were originally bred to do. Um, it's in no way <laughs> become obsolete to use herding dogs if you own livestock of any kind, still very popular. Um, herding trials are very popular, but for the most part, um, most people do not own cattle. I would say less people own cattle or sheep than they probably did in the past. So that's not where you'll see them most often, but they have really filled this niche of the modern working dog very well. They're very, very popular in conservation work, law enforcement, search and rescue service work, um, a lot of the behaviors that we'll talk about in a bit that might be challenging as a pet dog make them really, really excellent working dogs. So which is why they were bred to begin with, but these are just new interesting ways that we are choosing them in work these days. So we're kind of gonna talk about where things can go wrong. Um, we've talked a lot about their origins, the history, um, why certain behaviors might appear in some breeds and not in others. 
And we've also talked about just generally speaking, the appeal of them. So they're intelligent, they're athletic, people think that they're going to be great active pets um, to go hiking on the weekends or occasionally do some trick training, uh, but it tends to be not as idyllic. So some common problem behaviors, again, we have a lot of breeds to go through here. Um, and again, just kind of as a disclaimer, every dog is slightly different. So despite the fact that there are certainly breed typical behaviors, not all dogs are going to display these. Um, not all dogs are going to struggle with them, but these are kind of some of the most common ones. That's why they're on the list. So if there is a, like a kind of a herding related behavior that your dog might do, or that you've encountered other herding dogs and it's not on this list, we just, they're kind of weird, they're kind of quirky, so we don't have the time to talk about every behavior that's common for them. This is kind of the, this is the best of. Um, so alert barking, very common, attention seeking. And I wanna break that one down a little bit because I think we all mean different things when we say attention seeking. But um, if you have a herding breed, you've probably had a tennis ball or a frisbee or whatever their favorite toy is shoved in their lap and shoved in your lap repeatedly over and over and over. And now you have drool on you and your dog is slobbering and hyperventilating because, oh my God, it's so fun. Um, they pattern very easily. So um, you'll probably have a dog who is addicted to fetch or addicted to whatever it is their favorite toy is, and they can just not get enough of it. So they're just going to bring it to you over and over and over because isn't that your job to just throw the ball, right? Um, the next one, chasing animals, people, cars, um, certainly not limited to these three, uh, joggers, bikes, anything, um, just chasing quick moving things is pretty common. Um, controlling the interactions of other people or dogs or other animals as well. Um, this is the behavior that I call the fun police, right? Because they have been bred to control movement and depending on the breed to kind of create order out of chaos and certain interactions can really trouble them. So they feel the need to control them and they might bark at you, they might nip at you, um, they might bark and nip at other dogs. They don't like when they play. Um, so fun police type behaviors is what I call those. Um, freezing or staring at other animals, people or objects. This is also referred to as sticky behavior. So if you're a herding person, if you've ever taken your dog herding or read about it, um, this is the same thing. So working people often call this stickiness because they get stuck in an action pattern. They are stuck in the stare um, sequence. So they just stare at things and they might not move and might talk to your dog and they appear not to hear you or that they have no interest in listening because they are just frozen and stuck in that stare action pattern. Um, generally speaking, fixation, it's not, <laughs> that itself isn't a behavior, but it's just kind of describing that, um, that tendency to notice something or get into the habit of something and then that thing just becomes very very important and they have to fixate it um whatever it might be so that might be um people walking outside the window it could be people walking other dogs walking at a distance it could be prey animals it's just that need to constantly be vigilant constantly be alert and kind of fixate on things in the environment um nipping so we talked about that in fun police behaviors, but nipping probably deserves its own category because like we said, a lot of herding breeds like to use their mouth and their teeth to express themselves. That's what they've been bred to do is they control motion through using their mouth and their teeth. Um, and the last one here is neophobia, which I'm gonna kind of dive into a little bit because that might not be something that we would think of in terms of other behaviors on this list. So neophobia is just the fear of novelty, the fear of new things. Um, this can be seen in herding dogs, of course, again, not everyone, but it's not uncommon to see. So if you go somewhere new, if you experience something maybe stressful or startling, that your dog is just not a fan of new environments, that 
instead of being excited to visit somewhere new, they might be suspicious of somewhere new and they have to do a lot of investigating. They need to look into the distance and look at the other dog and the person and make sure that they aren't a threat and they're not gonna kill me. Um, this is just something that is more common in some breeds than others. So this is actually something that I see a lot in Border Collies, I see a lot in Aussies. Um, again, I'm not gonna say that that's super common, but it is a common problem behavior. Um, just that general fear and disease in new environments. So we're kind of going to get into what causes problem behaviors. And I, again, I want to put a disclaimer out here in that we only have so much time, so I can't get super into everything here. Um, but I don't want any of this to sound blaming or shaming of pet owners because that's certainly not the case. Um, you can't do better until you know better. And there are just a lot of people who were unaware of what free typical behaviors may have been in their dog's repertoire before they got them. So um, the first one that I want to start with is unmet needs. So that's exercise, enrichment, communication, and training. Um, if you have a dog whose needs are not being met, regardless of the training that you do, those needs need to be met first. So if you have a dog who's experiencing deprivation in any of these areas, that needs to be satiated beforehand or you are not likely to make progress. Um, something else here is an incompatible environment. So I want to kind of describe what that might be like. So if we have a dog who's vigilant, who notices all the things, who wants to attend to all the things, and they live in a high rise that's very busy. They see people all the time, they see dogs all the time, they hear the mailman all the time. Um, these things can cause chronic stress. Um, and so if you have a dog that, again, they have been bred to be vigilant and to attend to a variety of different stimuli in their environment, and they are kind of constantly in overload mode, um, it might not be the best environment for them. Um, that can also be the case for if you have a schedule where you're working 12 hour shifts four days a week and those three days off, you just wanna relax on the couch and watch Netflix, it's probably not going to be the best breed choice for you because they, they have higher needs than others. Um, so that might not be the best fit if you are seeing problem behaviors and your schedule cannot um, meet the needs of your dogs, it might not be a good fit. It might be an incompatible environment. So the next one here is lack of adequate socialization. We'll talk more about this in a bit, um, but with herding breed behaviors in mind, socialization might look a little bit different for anybody who has a herding breed puppy. So you're going to want to be aware, ideally ahead of time, of what breed typical behaviors might be in your dog's behavioral repertoire um, and what they look like, how they can be practiced in their environment. People often run into issues when they are unaware and to them it just looks like a problem behavior or an undesired behavior or they actually might be neutral um, and not have any strong feelings whatsoever but they're unaware that this behavior that might be neutral now might become a big problem for them later along the line. So um, this isn't super uncommon to see behaviors that are funny. So that might be chasing light or chasing a laser pointer. That's kind of funny and entertaining. We think it's fun for the dog, but then a year later, the dog is barking right before the sun sets every day because light is coming through the window. So um, just mindfulness in what these behaviors are going to be for your dog um, are going to be a big part of socializing them adequately for their breed. And lack of a broad behavioral repertoire. So some dogs simply do not have a better alternative for an undesirable behavior. So if they, as an example, they see something, they bark, 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 it just does not occur to them if they do not have other behaviors that they have been taught that they can respond differently. Um, and this goes for, again, any behavior that if we are going to ask for something different, they have to have that in their repertoire, in their toolbox and have a fairly strong reinforcement history for it 
if we're expecting that to be fluid in a multitude of environments. Um, the last one here is reinforcement history, which I kind of just talked about. But if we have had something continue to be practiced over and over, and we decide maybe within a year or two, hey, I don't like this behavior, we kind of dug ourselves into a hole. Yes, we can train, um, we can work to teach alternative behaviors, depending on what it is. But anything that has a really strong reinforcement history and has been practiced for a really long time, it's going to be harder to change. Um, this is unfortunately often seen in dogs who are adopted older in life, where we just don't know, we don't have that history of what behaviors they practiced in the past, what their life was like, what the routine was like. And we see once they adapt to their home that they likely have very strong reinforcement histories for a variety of behaviors that we might not want to see. Um, so with that in mind, we're always kind of trying to think of competing reinforcers in the environment, their learning history, and how we can kind of help, um, how we can kind of help balance those two things. And we're gonna talk more about that in a few slides over. Um, so this is kind of a funny slide and susceptibility to problem behavior. So we're specifically talking about in this webinar, problem behaviors in herding dogs, and we're not talking about problem behaviors in gun dogs or working group dogs or toy dogs. Um, granted, all dogs can be susceptible to problem behaviors, but I like to call herding breeds quirky in that there are just certain things about them due to what they were bred for that can make them a bit more susceptible than other breeds of dog. Um, and again, depending on what other groups of dogs were bred for, we might see different behaviors that could be problematic compared to a herding breed dog. But yeah, we're just talking specifically about this right now. So behavioral traits that are really, really good for working breeds and the work that they were bred for, um, but can be a little bit problematic for pets. So um, attentiveness and responsiveness. So you need to be attentive to your environment to be a good working dog. If you have a sheep that has said, all right, I'm out, bye guys, and runs away, um, we want the dog to see that and respond to that. Um, if they're just going to say, all right, bye, peace, and we have now multiple um, sheep, whatever the livestock, whatever the animal is that have now moved away from that herd, that could be the shepherd's livelihood. So that is a highly desirable trait is a dog who's attentive and a dog who's responsive. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen herding videos where a very subtle cue, it might be a whistle is given and the dog responds seamlessly. Um, so responsiveness is going to be time to respond, ability to respond, and sometimes it means responding to an environmental cue without actually having to be cued by their human. So the sheep moving away could be a cue to move towards them and control their movement and put them back with the rest um, that the dog will complete without actually having to be verbally cued by their person. Um, physical traits. So they're active, they're athletic, and robust was a funny word that the AKC uses to describe many herding breeds. And that just means that they're tough. Um, they're kind of, they're gritty. So they need to be physically strong dogs to do the kind of work that they do. Um, some dogs are going to kind of be like sprinters. Others might be more like cross-country runners. But regardless of how long they're working, what conditions they're working in, the job all around is just physically demanding. So they have to be really strong, healthy dogs to perform those behaviors. So with all of that in mind, um, as pet dogs, these can kind of create some challenges for us. So again, in work, attentiveness, responsiveness, it's highly desirable. They cannot do the work well without those traits. But in pet dogs, you know, we might not want our dog to notice every single dog or every little stimulus in the environment that can be overwhelming for them. It can be overwhelming for us. Um, and as far as responsiveness, even more so, we don't want our dogs to respond to everything that they see. Um, 
So that might be a squirrel jumping up a tree three blocks away. That could be another dog walking on the opposite side of the road, but we don't necessarily want our dog to see that and respond to it. We ideally are just going to go for our walk or be out in the world and our dog can observe it without feeling the need to respond or engage with it in some way. Um, that's going to be probably one of the more common problem behaviors are barky lungy, reactive type behaviors that herding breeds notice everything. <laughs> and it can, again, it be very overwhelming. And so we get a lot more responsiveness, a lot more reactiveness to different stimuli in the environment. Um, and physically, uh, a lot of people think that the best route to owning and working a herding breed dog is to provide a lot of exercise. Um, those are some of the most common things is that they are super active and therefore you'll have to be active for them. So some people get themselves into trouble and kind of dig themselves into a little hole where they say, okay, my 10 month old Aussie is biting my kid's ankles or hurting my children. Um, I think that I need to provide more exercise. And so they start jogging with their puppy, which that is a separate conversation. We'll talk about age appropriate activities, but they start exercising their dog a lot. And at first it helps. So great, the behavior seems to be resolved, um, but then it pops up again. So they need more and more exercise. And some people do what I call creating an athlete. Actually, I don't call it. It's, <laughs> it's a very common phrase that we'll use is you create an, an athlete um, accidentally where now just to function in a day, this dog that is fairly young, um, and owned by somebody whose schedule might not accommodate this now needs five to 10 miles of running every day. Um, and their human may have been fine with two miles, may have been fine with an occasional hike, um, but that daily need for more and more and more exercise is just not sustainable. And frankly, um, depending on the age of the dog is not healthy for them either. Um, so these are a few ways that we can kind of get in trouble for Again, really good for working dogs, but as pet dogs, we have to be careful because it's not difficult to create problems here. So here, um, I'm actually going to do a little disclaimer first. I'm gonna show a few videos of different, um, very typical behaviors um, in a variety of herding breeds. And I wanna thank everybody who sent these videos into me over Instagram. They were really helpful. Uh, they're a pretty good variety into showcasing how we might see these behaviors and where they might pop up out in the world. Um, I also want to put out a disclaimer that um, a lot of these behaviors that you're going to see are not necessarily maladaptive or problematic. It's, again, very typical behavior. So um, I don't want any of these videos to be perceived as, oh, these are bad dogs or these are really problematic behaviors. Um, I want to have really good conversations after I show you guys these videos on um, why they might be considered problematic or why they might be concerning, but how they in themselves are not necessarily um, bad or problematic. So, well, yeah, we'll get into that without me rambling too much. So here we have a cattle dog and we're gonna watch this video and then we'll break it down a little bit. And so we have this cattle dog puppy, young dog, notices another dog. And he's low to the ground. And now we have some stalking behavior. And we have some hard staring, some creeping. Okay, so this is a pretty short clip. Um, we'll break it down a little bit. So we have a young cattle dog here. Um, they are engaging in a behavior that's fairly common for herding breeds in social environment. So 
this dog sees another dog and it goes into a crouching or stalking like position and moves towards the other dog that way to greet them. So this is a really great video because the person working them is doing a great job. This dog is on a harness, this dog is on a long line um, and it's fairly safe. But why this might be considered problematic depending on the context is brief typical behaviors in herding dogs are not necessarily behaviors that are common to see in other breeds of dogs. So for herding dogs, you'll often hear people say that they get along really well with other herding dogs and that they play best with other herding dogs. Um, this obviously isn't always the case, but this is common because they share similar social behaviors. So their behaviors make sense to them. Um, socially, it's just a fairly seamless interaction. But with other dogs, if they see a dog stalking and crouching and moving towards them, that can be perceived a lot differently for a dog who does not have that behavior in their repertoire. That can be considered fairly threatening, kind of scary to have this dog approaching them that way. And so it, it's not uncommon to hear of herding dogs who are considered friendly. They are dog social, dog selective, maybe um, just haven't had issues with other dogs. Um, have issues depending on how they're greeting other dogs because their social behavior is what I would consider incompatible with some other dogs and it's not perceived to be um, friendly behavior despite the fact that they are not meaning any harm. So that was a really good video, um, super common in a variety of herding breeds. Oops, so let me skip to the next. And so this is a really short clip. We talked about fun police behavior. So um, this is super short. We'll watch it real quick and then we can talk a little bit more about it. So really short, we can actually watch it again. And if possible, I might try to slow it down, which perfect I can. So I'm gonna put it at half speed and we can get a slightly better look on what's going on here. Okay, so we have a group of three cattle dogs playing. Well, we have a group of three cattle dogs, two of them are playing. And then this third dog runs in, kind of does his bark, bark, and then runs away. <laughs> so again, this is really common um, fun police behavior, as we call it. And typically what the intention of this behavior is, is to control motion in some way, or they are responding to motion. So. You can see the two dogs are playing, they're having a good time, and this third dog comes over and intervenes, runs away. It's not that deep, um, but again, depending on the group of dog, this can sometimes create conflict that they do not appreciate another dog coming over and intervening in their play. Um, this group, totally fine, all dogs were fine, no issues, but again, um, this is a group of herding dogs and depending on the breed of dogs in a different group, it might not be perceived um, or tolerated in the same way. Um, even in groups of dogs where we're not necessarily worried about conflict or any kind of fighting, it can sometimes just be stressful for the dog who feels the need to control the group. Um, because again, many breeds are to create some kind of um, some kind of order out of chaos. So if you've seen livestock move, it can be very chaotic. There's a lot going on. Um, and they their job is to create order, is to move them to the desired location, to keep them together when they're all trying to move apart. Um, and granted, again, that's what they were bred to do. But for dogs who don't have that working experience, and that's not what they were trained to do in their day-to-day -day life, it can cause stress to constantly be vigilant and constantly feel the need to control the motion or interaction of other dogs or people in the household. Oops, okay. All right, and here is a, another good video. We'll watch it first and then we can chat about it. 
She's going to turn this down a little bit. So that's a really good example of a border collie kind of controlling motion. Um, in this video, it's not super deep. Um, their person is not bothered by this. It's more playful. It's more of a game. Um, it's not problematic in that it's not causing anybody in the household harm or stress. Um, but it's a really good example of watching this dog move towards the vacuum and try to control its motion. Um, let me see if I can pull some stills here. You'll see some of the working behaviors that we talked about earlier. So you can see in several different parts of this clip where we have a hard stare, some hard eye. Um, we have a low crouching posture. So just a really good way to show how in a totally different context, there is no sheep, there's no cow, but how these behaviors can surface in just day-to-day -day life and what they look like and why they might be happening. And this is, I believe, our last video that we're gonna watch. And this is also a short clip. Okay, so let's watch that one more time and I'm actually going to slow this one down too because there are some good moments and it's so short, I don't want everybody to miss them. Okay, so of the videos that we've watched, this is probably the most concerning. Um, we're seeing some car chasing, and that is super, super common in herding breeds. Um, we talked about this earlier in our list of potentially problematic behaviors, um, chasing people, animals, cars, other moving objects. Um, it's very, very common, but of course, of the things you could chase, this is probably the most dangerous, um, definitely concerning, um, especially if we're worried at any point of the person losing control of the leash or the dog getting loose, it can be obviously very dangerous or life-threatening. Um, I want to also slow this down and just show, before we get to the end of the clip, we have a lot of staring at cars, Kind of stalking towards them and then in this last clip right at the end we have this car pass by closer than the others and then that's where we get that chasing behavior come in okay so we'll move on from here Oops. so with all of that being said um, in those videos like i said kind of in my little disclaimer is that none of these behaviors in their original, um, the original reason that they are bred, it's hard to call them bad or problematic. Um, at worst, they're typically safety concerns, which that last video really exemplified where we do not want this behavior to cause that dog harm or potentially cause other dogs or other people harm. Um, so prevention is, obviously ideal where either you just got the dog, 
you just got the puppy, maybe you haven't had your dog or puppy, you haven't adopted them yet, prevention is by far the most ideal route that we can prevent any problems before they start. Um, so the first tip that I really have is just know your herding dog, um, whether you are adopting a dog from a breeder, from a shelter, from a rescue, if you have any kind of inkling of um, the breed that you might be interested in, regardless of if they're a purebred or they're a mixed breed, that's a really good place to start. So if you know that you're really interested in, for example, maybe a cattle dog mix or an Aussie mix, a Corgi mix, just educating yourself on what those breed typical behaviors for that breed are, are gonna be a really, really good place to start. Um, of course, if we have any more information on if they're maybe Aussie German Shepherd or um, an exact breed mix, of course, the more information, the better because there's multiple breeds, there's multiple behaviors interacting. Um, but regardless of um, breed type, it's ideal to just understand herding breed behaviors and what their typical behaviors are. Um, so in that, it's going to be identifying breed typical behaviors. So if you're seeing something that might be concerning or you're just not really sure why it's happening, um, it removes a lot of the anxiety being a new pet parent um, by knowing what's happening. So I think the unknown tends to be scary, but when we can say, okay, this is actually fairly common for the breed. This is fairly common for herding breeds um, across the board. I know what this means. Being able to identify them just removes a lot of the anxiety. It removes a lot of the worrying because at least we have that place to start. Um, from there, Kind of knowing how to identify appropriate and inappropriate practices of that behavior is going to be important as well. So um, a good example from those videos earlier would be um, if your dog likes to move towards your vacuum and bark at it and it doesn't bother you, that's fine. That's appropriate. That is not causing anybody harm. Um, the dog isn't going to be hurt. You're not going to be hurt your vacuum is probably going to be fine. So I would consider that an appropriate um, way to exercise that behavior. Um, of course, with the note that we, we keep an eye out that it does not um, start to develop in, in inappropriate con uh, contexts. Um, inappropriate contexts could be anything that is likely to potentially cause harm. So like we said earlier, controlling motion in a group of other dogs, depending on the group, you might be fine, um, but other dogs might not appreciate that. So understanding when and where these behaviors can be practiced is going to be important. Um, having that desire to control motion inside with the vacuum or with maybe a broom or any other game, if everybody is safe and nobody's bothered, appropriate. But if your dog is trying to control the motion of um, of cars or bikers or joggers, and they are going to pull you towards them or run towards them, um, of course that's inappropriate because that can be extremely harmful if not fatal to them. Um, and we do not want that um, to be reinforced and rehearsed throughout their life. Um, and lastly, just very typical behaviors as reinforcers, which I kind of just mentioned is any breed typical behavior, um, they tend to be very, very reinforcing. And again, these behaviors are, depending on the dog, more strong and more prevalent in some dogs compared to others. But practicing these behaviors can be very reinforcing, and that's why they continue to be practiced over and over. So um, being aware of that, depending on the context, is going to be really important. If you have a behavior that is being practiced in an inappropriate context that could be harmful to your dog or people or other dogs or animals. Um, it's really important to limit the amount of times that they can practice and rehearse this behavior because the more and more it's practiced, the more it's reinforced. And then we have a really, really strong reinforcement history to contend with, which is much more difficult to train. And to kind of continue this to <laughs> really good segue that I got into is just preventing the rehearsal of these behaviors in contexts that are not appropriate. Um, 
we kind of go into the ABCs of hurting behavior. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about, um, the ABCs refer to uh, an applied behavior analysis way of breaking down behavior. So you have the antecedent, which means that was whatever was happening before. That could be um, something in the environment. It could be something internally. Um, but that is what happened directly before the behavior happened. The B is the behavior. And C is the consequence of whatever behavior that was. So uh, we're not going to get super deep into the ABCs, but I did want to talk about antecedents because they are everywhere. And antecedent arrangement or management of the environment is going to be a really powerful tool in preventing rehearsal of behaviors that could be problematic. Um, so familiarizing yourself with what antecedents occur before specific pre-typical behaviors occur is going to be really important. I have this noted here specifically in movement because it can trigger a lot of different pre-typical behaviors from hurting dogs. So it can be barking, it can be chasing, it can be biting. Um, but at the end of the day, they were bred to control movement, they were bred to control motion, and they have a variety of behaviors in their behavioral repertoire that they use to do that. So um, kind of understanding what was happening before this behavior happened is going to be really important um, because we can modify the environment and make changes to potentially alter that behavior if it's not going to be safe for them or the household. So best practices, um, these are kind of the, not cut and dry, but, but suggestions for how to live with your hurting breed dog and um, what my general recommendations would be to prevent the development of problematic behaviors that are specifically common for hurting breed dogs. So, um, I have the four steps here. If anybody is familiar with Sarah Streming of the Cognitive Canine, this is kind of her way of um, ensuring what she calls behavioral wellness. And I will have this linked at the end in my references. I highly recommend everybody check her out. She's also a hurting breed nerd. Um, but the four steps are essentially what you will practice with your dog to ensure that they're living their best healthy life, essentially. So. We have exercise, we have enrichment, we have nutrition and communication. I'm really not going to go heavily into nutrition. I'm not a vet, I'm not a nutritionist, um, but essentially that your dog is not having um, any kind of allergies, any kind of GI issues, anything in their diet that would be causing them distress or causing them physical ailment. Uh, we want a diet that nourishes their body. We want a diet that makes them feel good. Um, so that is going to be a very key component of behavioral wellness. Um, Exercise and enrichment. Enrichment really is just the practice of either species or breed typical behaviors, being able to be a dog, being able to, um, oops, we have some, okay, there we go. Um, so that's going to be huge for them. Um, exercise, again, they, they are active dogs. They might need more exercise than a different breed of dog. Um, but I, I always kind of recommend that we, we find a nice happy medium. So we don't want to create an athlete. Um, I'm in no way suggesting that we over-exercise our dogs. That's obviously a different conversation, but giving healthy ways to move their body. Um, I really love long lines. I really love um, safe opportunities to be off leash decompression walks. Those are really, really great opportunities for herding breeds too get adequate exercise. Um, and in, as far as enrichment, they, they are likely going to need more than the average pet breed, because again, they do, they do have a lot more tendency to need to use their mind, need to use their body. Um, thinking about what they were bred to do, they might be working for hours on end or working on and off for hours throughout the day. So it's really important that we provide them different healthy opportunities, activities, and outlets to um, practice either free typical behaviors or just across the board species typical behaviors. And the last piece here, communication, that's going to refer to more, more relationship-based, um, your communication with your dog. So um, 
having a healthy environment, an environment that they feel safe in, an environment that they feel comfortable in, and of course, a relationship that they feel comfortable and safe in with you. Those are going to be really important ways to keep your dog healthy and safe. Um, again, I'll link her, uh, I'll link her article. It's um, a really great read. It's not super long, and she definitely does a great job describing it. Um, so next is mind mindful socialization. So that's what we talked about earlier, where we want to be aware of what behaviors are breed typical, ideally before we have our dog or puppy. Um, of course, with older dogs, we can work on what would be considered remedial socialization. In this case, I'll probably be more so talking about puppies um, if we're thinking about their critical socialization period. Um, so practicing mindful socialization, knowing what behaviors are fairly typical for them, knowing when they tend to be practiced. So in herding breed puppies, when we have really mouthiness or barking or um, whatever behaviors might be considered fairly problematic, a good way, a good rule of thumb is probably that they need a nap if these breeds are suddenly, if these behaviors are suddenly becoming exasperated and much more, uh, much more severe than just normal puppy behavior, typically they need a nap. So that's going to be another antecedent in the environment of my puppy is tired, therefore these behaviors are exasperated and I'm going to put them in their exercise pen or give them a Kong and let them relax. And it's actually not that big a deal. So next we have age and or skill appropriate activities. So um, if you have a puppy, I would say it's both age and skill appropriate. Um, but we don't want to do anything that is going to be pushing their body or pushing their mental capacity at the age that they're at. Um, we'll see this often in very well-meaning pet owners, but you might think, okay, I want to enroll my herding breed puppy in an agility class or an obedience class or something that we think will be a very healthy outlet for, um, for their breed and for the behaviors that we are likely aware of, um, but there, there are certainly situations where they need to learn to be a dog or they need to learn their life skills and the behaviors that are going to make them feel safe and comfortable in the world before they get to those specific activities. So that might be over-exercising, um, that might be taking a, ch a class that's just too challenging or overstimulating. Uh, the kind of trap that we sometimes fall into with these dogs is that they are very bright and they are, they, they do tend to be very, um, very eager to work. And I would, I'm not going to say please us, but they, they're just dogs that really, really enjoy um, working. And they're kind of sometimes what I would consider like adrenaline junkies, or they're just addicted to that dopamine rush of reinforcement. So they'll sometimes push themselves beyond what I would consider appropriate for their age. So specifically with puppies, um, I, I want to make sure that I am not pushing this puppy beyond what they're capable of at whatever their specific age is. And despite the fact that physically or mentally they might continue to push themselves, I am going to make the decision as the person that they're not ready for this yet. Um, skill appropriate would be, of course, if you adopt an older dog and we really don't have much information about their background, they have a fairly low, if not non-existent behavioral repertoire. Um, I wanna make sure that this dog, again, understands how to feel safe and how to navigate their environment before putting them in a situation that might cause them more harm than good. So if I've just adopted a dog and they really don't understand how to be a dog and they do not feel safe in their environment, I'm going to hold off from enrolling in them, on enrolling them in that obedience class, even if they don't have any known behaviors yet, because there's a lot that we can do beforehand to make them feel safe and to actually build a relationship first. So teaching them how to access reinforcement, teaching them how to navigate their environment, um, teaching them to really just exist in new spaces. So these are all things where either age appropriate or skill appropriate, I wanna make sure that this dog is going to be comfortable and safe in the world and they're not pushing themselves despite the fact that physically and mentally they are um, very capable of enduring probably more than the average dog. 
And lastly, uh, this is kind of related, but I call it life skills before the flashy skills. So for any age of dog, there are just a list of a few things that I want to make sure that they know uh, before we're going out in the world. So if you have a new dog or puppy, uh, these are the behaviors that I want them to know really before we start teaching them tricks or enroll them in an agility class or an obedience class. So I kind of mentioned it before, I want them to understand how to access reinforcement. Um, I want them to be comfortable with things that are going to happen in their environment. So that might be a variety of sounds in the house, that might be a variety of sounds outside the house, that could be handling and husbandry, but these are all going to be things that they encounter on a near daily basis. So I want to be sure that they're comfortable with this before I teach them how to wave or high five. Um, even if they'll learn it very quickly in one session, which they often do, especially as young puppies, it's very tempting to say, oh, my, my 12 week old puppy already knows 10 or 15 tricks. But if they can't feel safe or comfortable in a new environment, that's really where I want my focus to be. We can always come back and teach those tricks. So those life skills are going to be really important. So I have a video here of my puppy, I don't, I think she was maybe 10 or 12 weeks old at the time, uh, but I was trying to practice what I preached. I really did not work on too many trick behaviors with her until she was a bit older. She's a year and a half now, um, but I believe this is our first formal husbandry session. So this is going to be kind of emulating what a vet visit would look like. So we can watch this real quick. So at this point, she's already shaped coming onto a platform, which is there. And we have some medical equipment. So I'm just getting her used to a stethoscope. Um, this was the age of COVID puppies. So I, I actually have never been in an exam room with her and I wanted her to be more than comfortable before going to get her next round of vaccinations. So we're touching her back, we're putting it on her belly, on her chest, just all over her body um, to ensure that she's comfortable here. And if she had at any point got off of her station and walked away, the procedure would have stopped. Um, that would be a very clear indicator to me that she is not interested in this, she's not comfortable for this, and we would not continue until she either came back or that would just end the session. Either one is totally fine. But um, this is just an example of some of those life skills that I would like to emphasize that we work on prior to those trick training skills or sport skills, whatever it is that you have interest in doing with your dog. Um, I always want to emphasize those life skills for herding breeds in particular, because it's, it's really tempting to show off to our friends what they can do. Um, they can often be going back to neophobia, it's not uncommon for them to struggle with handling and husbandry. Um, herding breeds can be very sensitive to physical pressure. So that means if you're standing close to them, um, they might not feel comfortable or a new person handling them might not be comfortable. So that was really important to me. Um, whoops, get the next video. And this is the really short clip of, I think my puppy at six or seven months old. Um, this is just a park trip. So going out into the world, I think this was um, during a Frisbee league. So in the background, we have some people and dogs playing Frisbee. There are kids here. There's just a lot going on. And we're just hanging out. Um, I'm not really asking anything specific of her, but I want to know, does she feel comfortable? Can she eat? Can she play with a toy? Um, can she engage with me? Can she practice an easy walnut behavior? So this is just a short clip from these kind of trips that I would do with her. So she's just hanging out. We have some people back here, dogs playing Frisbee, kids going by. And you can see here we're at, we're at a pretty good distance. I'm not moving too close. Um, it's kind of the end of winter here. You can see snow melting. So the winter was pretty barren. So I'm gonna start at a distance where it's it's easy for her to be successful. It's easy for her to not um, fixate on the environment. It's easy for her to disengage with it and engage with me. And of course, um, depending on 
what I would like in the future, um, for example, some agility behaviors is as I'm seeing success, I can move closer to those distracting um, elements in the environment. So the person with the dog, the kid on the bike, whatever those things are. But before we move too close, I wanna make sure that they're comfortable here. And of course, I know we have, we have a lot of behaviors that we can talk about as far as prevention goes. We just don't have time to talk about all of them, but yeah, that was one. So I'll move on now to solutions. So if you already have your dog and prevention was unfortunately not possible for this dog, um, maybe you adopted an older dog, this is probably going to be more relevant for you. Um, so some things to consider first is for any behavior, we want to know what is the function of it. So um, we talked about earlier for a lot of breed typical behaviors for herding breeds, the function is often controlling motion, controlling movement. Um, and it often surfaces in different ways. Um, the next thing I'm gonna be thinking about are what are the consequences of this behavior? Um, does it produce reinforcement? So we also discussed how many breed typical behaviors can be highly reinforcing to perform. And the more and more they're rehearsed, we have a very strong reinforcement history that's difficult to compete with. And the last thing that I'm gonna be considering is, is this behavior harmful? So to your dog, to people or other animals, and last I have to society, which kind of means just more abstract. So if your dog is alert barking at everything and you live in a small apartment with really thin walls, that might be upsetting to your neighbor or neighbors that might report you. And of course, that's going to be a more abstract problem. So um, why I want to consider this last piece is, we don't want to constantly be in this dialogue with our dogs where we're trying to extinguish these breed typical behaviors because um, ethically speaking, they are a herding breed dog. It is in their behavioral repertoire. It's our responsibility to educate ourselves either before or after and kind of, kind of think about what we can live with, what we can't live with and causing harm is one of those things for me. If it's not causing harm to anybody, um, we can of course find ways to practice it more appropriately, but if it's at worst just annoying, um, sometimes we can live with that, sometimes we can't, but just one of those things to consider is, is it harmful? So the next step is, can the function of this behavior be met elsewhere? So if your dog, for example, is, you know, when you walk is nipping at your ankles, or if they're observing um, maybe the other dogs move in the backyard, or if you have children and the children are running and they're nipping at them, they're trying to control their emotions, they're barking at them. Again, we are probably aware at this point, um, they are in their way trying to control the motion of things in their environment. Um, actual working dogs who are trained to move livestock and herd livestock um, but despite the fact that they do have that behavior, they are taught how to use it appropriately. Um, and so it would not be considered appropriate to hurt children. Um, they are given a cue to herd and perform different behaviors on these livestock to perform a variety of tasks. So if the function of this behavior can be met elsewhere, so maybe we buy a herding ball, we get our dog into tri ball, um, we find a way that we can at least provide an appropriate outlet while we teach an alternative behavior in the situation that is inappropriate for it to practice. Um, that's kind of going to come back to the ethics of where can we meet this need somewhere in their life? Um, another question is, can we provide the dog alternative forms of reinforcement? So hurting breed behaviors, they can be very reinforcing to perform. Um, so if we can find ways to provide alternative forms of reinforcement, um, it can be an activity, it can be through reinforcement, through a learned behavior, um, but kind of trying to troubleshoot what can we change, where can we provide something else that's reinforcing. Um, this can get tricky because we have what's called competing reinforcers is we need to try to provide something that is equally, if not more reinforcing than the behavior that they're already performing, because again, it's inherently reinforcing to them. So we might have to get a little bit creative to find out what, what other activity that they can engage in alternatively to that. Um, and the last step that I've alluded to is 
what is the least intrusive way to create behavior change? Um, again, ethically speaking, they have engaged in these behaviors for hundreds of years because they have selectively been bred to do so. And granted, they can be weird, they can be annoying, um, but we can't expect to extinguish them entirely. So that's why we're going to spend a lot of time trying to think of where can I provide an appropriate outlet for this behavior. Um, so the two Ds here, as far as actual training and behavior modification for dogs, again, this is kind of just a broad general overview. This is not in any way trying to be a behavior modification plan that is not the scope of this webinar. Um, but two tools that I find very effective for herding breed dogs are desensitization and differential reinforcement. So I think a lot of us have heard of desensitization. We're likely familiar with it. Um, specifically for things like noise sensitivity or motion sensitivity, desensitization is something that will often be used. So um, for herding breed dogs, we're again, often going back to motion. So from the beginning, we're trying to desensitize for that. But if we already have our dog, um, or maybe we adopt an adult dog, and they're very sensitive to motion, that could be you know, prey animals, that could be other dogs, that could be the kids running in the yard or joggers or bikers, we're going to want to use desensitization to help them, um, help them create different behaviors and different feelings in that situation. So kind of like I mentioned earlier, um, working dogs that are being used to herd livestock, they do not just run after and chase them. They are given cues. Um, they often watch other dogs work. So there is a lot of desensitization that goes into being able to, you know, maintain stimulus control of other behaviors in the presence of whatever stimulus it is that's causing motion and eliciting that, that desire to move and control it. Um, differential reinforcement, this is something I'll explain a little bit more because um, it's not as common. So differential reinforcement is essentially we are going to reward or reinforce a behavior that is not the behavior of concern. So a DRI is differential reinforcement of an incompatible behavior. So what that means is incompatible, a behavior that you cannot practice the problem behavior um, while also practicing this other behavior. So if you have a dog that is excessively barking, well, you can't bark if a ball is in your mouth. So maybe we teach you to go get the ball instead of barking. Um, an alternative behavior would be not necessarily incompatible, but another behavior that might make it a little bit more challenging to engage in this behavior of concern or problematic behavior. And last, we have a DRO, which just means other behavior. And that essentially means that depending on what the behavior is, we're going to reinforce every behavior that is not this problem behavior. And uh, this is used um, Really, it depends what it is. Um, we see this a lot in aggression cases. We see this a lot in resource guarding. Um, but, but depending what the behavior of concern or interest is, we can use a variety of different, different, different differential reinforcement strategies to help create alternative behaviors um, or help, help kind of on the path of as we're teaching an alternative behavior. Um, so those are some common tools that I would recommend um, in a training plan for um, herding dogs and breed specific behaviors, of course, depending on what it is, because it's obviously a lot more complicated. We have the ABCs to think about, we have the environment, um, but yeah, those are just some tools that I like to use. And here is a quick video of me working with my dog here, just for some context, I think she's roughly I don't know, six or seven months old here, we're at Frisbee League. So a behavior that she has worked a lot on is not shocking, is motion sensitivity. So um, other dogs playing Frisbee, other dogs running agility, very, very interesting to her, um, pulling on her leash, wanting to move towards them, wanting to chase. So we had to work a lot on desensitization as well as just rewarding alternative behaviors at a distance at first that she could be successful in. So 
Um, behind me here, we have some people playing Frisbee with their dogs at a Frisbee league. We have some dogs and cars being loaded up here. And I'm just walking her around and working on some basic engagement stuff um, at the beginning of this. So we have some people over here. She's very much aware that they are playing. You can hear them. She's walking around and you'll see her look towards them. This is really at the start. Um, you can see that she would like to move towards them, but makes a great choice not to. And we have this man walking his dog back to his car. She sees them and she offers a nice sit and some eye contact. So really short clip um, cut off before I could show anything else, but um, that's just an example of how we could use some of these tools of differential reinforcement as well as desensitization, where prior to this video, I was doing the desensitization work. Um, I was having her in the environment, but removed enough from whatever the trigger was that she could still engage in behaviors like play, like eating treats, like scatter, eating, uh, scatter feeding in the ground. So I'm gonna be asking these questions of what can you do in this environment? At what distance? Where are you comfortable? And that's where we're gonna start. And that is kind of the extent of this webinar. Um, I know I went definitely over time, but there's a lot to talk about and I kind of feel like I barely scraped the surface of it. Um, some recommended reading is Meet Your Dog by Kim Brophy. She does a really, really great job of kind of synthesizing different traits of herding breeds. Um, she talks a lot, again, about breed typical behaviors and she just does a really good job of presenting these ideas in a way that's easily accessible and it's actually fun to learn about your dog. So highly recommend checking that out. Um, I also have linked here, uh, Sarah Strumming's website, The Cognitive Canine. And this article is specifically the four steps to behavioral wellness that she talks a lot about for her herding breeds, for her active um, sport dogs in agility and obedience, um, but is relevant for any dog, uh, regardless of the breed. So I highly recommend checking out these two resources. Um, where to find me? I'm on most things. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook at Naturally Canine Behavior. Sometimes Facebook is weird. So the hyperlink is just slash Naturally Canine Behavior. Um, I have my email here as well as my website, but I try to keep my social media fairly active. <laughs> I don't always do a great job of that. So it might take me a few days, if not a week to post new content. I do check messages regularly. I do check my emails every day. Um, so if you have any questions that are kind of beyond the scope of this webinar, do feel free to send me an email or reach out and I would be happy to chat with you. Um, I have references for everything here. Um, some of these are a bit more technical than others. Some are going to be drier than others, but I do really recommend checking out at least a few of these, browsing them, kind of glancing through these articles and books because they are a wealth of knowledge, um, especially um, the Copingers, they are really wonderful sources of information for canine ethology. So highly recommend checking them out if you would like to take a deeper dive than we had time to do today. But otherwise, I think we are all done here. We can get to some questions and I hope that this was informational. I know I went over time. I also feel like I barely talked about anything. So I hope that you guys got some good use out of it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nisa. Um, for those who don't know, Nisa and I actually know each other through a master's program in applied animal behavior. So you can definitely tell that the uh, behavior nerd gene is running strong here. Um, so tons and tons of information about why our herding dogs are the way that they are, um, which I feel like sometimes we we don't get into because it's like here's here's what's going on here's how we fix it so it's nice to have that that background so that we know when we actually have a problem and what ways we can address that so one of the questions we had was about fearful border collies um our dog is scared of new people and new things um, we get big barks and retreating once he accepts he's a huge lover but he hasn't been able to generalize yeah so 
Yeah, that sounds like a border collie. Definitely, we have a lot of those. So that definitely falls into what we talked about earlier, kind of the neophobia of just new environments, new people, new situations are just, they tend to be suspicious rather than welcoming. But like you said, once they meet them, they're typically fairly comfortable. So um, I can't get too much into what I would consider like the behavior mod plans or anything like that. But I would really try to start thinking about um, how you can really narrow down maybe the environment or the context or just anything that you can kind of create a pattern in what your dog tends to be fearful of. Um, I know it's hard when seemingly they're scared of everything or they're fear fearful in every environment, but um, I would try to start there. I would try to categorize and I would try to um, ask those questions when you go somewhere new of, can you do this here? Can you take food from my hand? Can you take food from the ground? Can you eat a treat scatter? Can you play with your favorite toy? And I would kind of work through these things in um, just a systematic way in these new environments. Um, I know when it involves people who are new, it can be a little bit tricky because we only have so many friends and family members that we can employ in a controlled environment. But I do find that, um, you know, Facebook groups, local pet groups, they can be really great ways to kind of employ um, new people in a more controlled setting that you can kind of give away of, you know, this is my idea. This is what you're getting into. Are you comfortable with this? I'm going to maybe do weird stuff with my dog in front of you. Just be down for it. We might walk towards you. We might not. Um, but I would um, really, my overall point is I would listen to what your dog has to say. So if your dog can't eat from the ground or your dog can't eat from your hand. Uh, your dog can't meet a new person. If they can do all of those things and they can also look at them without barking, they can maybe play at a distance. I would work from there and I would find those environments that feel a bit more safe to them. So um, I hope that's helpful. I know there's a, there's a lot more that we can get into. So feel free to send me an email, but yeah, I, I hope that's helpful. And then one other great question um, suggestions on redirecting or what are some of your favorite redirection techniques for nipping behaviors? Yeah. So for hurting breed behaviors or breed typical behaviors, they do tend to be, like I said, so highly reinforcing that I found the best way to, um, kind of intervene is to really, really, really split that behavior into the tiniest piece. So, um, nipping behavior, I would probably want a little bit more information on what are they nipping? Um, what was occurring before they were nipping? What is your dog's um, effective state? These are all questions that I would have um, that would provide me a little bit more information. Um, looking at the antecedents, if your dog is tired, if your dog has recently, whether it was immediately or maybe um, a few hours after a stressful encounter, I would want to know these things about their effective state. It's really common to see behaviors like nipping really get worse um, and become exasperated when the dog is under some form of stress, whether it's just simply being tired or whether they've gone through what we call trigger stacking and everything is kind of built up into this behavior. Um, if not, branded dogs can just hurting dogs nip sometimes without any kind of stress. That's just kind of what they do sometimes. So I would really work on splitting a, an alternative behavior down into its tiny piece. So I really like clicker training for this. Um, I would think about the situation that your dog is nipping in and what a what a reasonable or alternative behavior would be. So what ever that behavior you could um, think of. Again, I don't really know the circumstances, but I would try to break it into its tiniest part. Um, I would try to offer something that is highly reinforcing to the dog, because again, these behaviors can be very reinforcing, but we need to be aware of, be aware of competing reinforcers in the environment and do our part to offer something that is actually going to be of use to them. Awesome. Great answer for that one. Well, thank you so much, Nisa. I really appreciate you coming to talk about this. I know there were a lot of people who wanted to learn more about this. I'm sure they will all have
questions tomorrow when they <laughs> synthesize it. Um, folks, if you want to support us in the things that we do, please check out our future webinars. They're all at everydogaustin.org slash webinars. Um, we would love to have you do things like make a donation if you feel comfortable or buy one of our t-shirts that say dog training is for everyone because that's a big part of our mission. Uh, let folks know about us. If you're in the Austin area, join a class or you're welcome to sign up for private training if that's something that you would like to do. Um, but we hope to, to keep seeing you at our upcoming webinars and uh, keep spreading the good word and doing awesome things with your dogs. So no, everybody have a great me, night. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Night. And I will make sure the recording goes out tomorrow unless YouTube gets mad at me, but hopefully I'll have it out to everybody tomorrow. Thank awesome. you so Thanks much for having me. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.